Hey, Brett. Hey, Keith. You guys get more rain down there today? No, we had about a half inch, so that was about right. We have good subsoil moisture. But, uh, I think we're going on 10 inches in 10 days. Here we've had three inches this go around and probably seven last week. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to have to find a new mowing guy for this summer. Why is that? He made the front page news of the uh, went to jail for selling drugs. <laughs> Apparently he had a summer business and a winter business. Uh, yeah, well, that's, uh, yeah. There is such a thing as bad publicity, I guess, huh? <laughs> Unlawful possession of controlled drug with intent to distribute drug activity and unlawful possession of drug paraphernalia which has to be being here again we are live on facebook as well uh basically what we're doing today uh same thing we did last week we are here to answer questions so uh we just want you folks to ask questions uh myself i'm keith burns uh brett peshik uh he is my main guy down in oklahoma uh, my sales rep and agronomist down there and then uh, we also have Dale Strickler on the phone. Uh, he will be here to answer questions as well. Dale, say hi. Hello, everyone. So you can ask any question you want, uh, any topic around soil health, around grazing. Uh, you know, Dale's written a couple of really good uh, pasture management grazing type books if you have any questions around that. Uh, Brett is uh, uh, running... Um, a variety of different animals down in Oklahoma, uh, pastured pigs, sheep, goats, uh, as well as cattle. So we've got quite a bit of experience here on the call. I am, since, since we're a relatively small group, I am allowing everybody to talk. So if you'd like to ask a question, just unmute yourself and ask your question. Or if you want to raise your hand, uh, there should be a little button at the bottom of your Zoom screen where you can click on it and you can raise your hand and uh, then I can specifically call on you uh, to do that. So uh, anybody got a question they want to start with? All right, we can, an we can maybe answer one of Eric's questions that he emailed in yesterday. Uh, <clears throat> So Eric is in Northeast Iowa, uh, corn yields 225 and he chops silage about 25 to 30 tons per acre. Is there something else that we could uh, plant the same amount of feed for cattle? Uh, would like to diversify, but corn is awfully hard to beat um, on the yield wise in that climate. Um, Dale, do you want to kind of start off with that? Yeah, I, I've got some thoughts. I mean, agriculture, um, it, it's all about converting sunlight into something useful. And obviously, in this case, the something useful that they're after is silage. And every day that you can capture sunlight is, is good in, in producing biomass. Um, and it's not that corn is bad, but corn is, corn, silage corn really only occupies the ground for about four months, which leaves eight months open to grow something else. And so, you know, I look at uh, someone who's trying to maximize silage yield and, uh, and, and do so at minimal expense. I think something that I would consider in addition is let's say you go ahead and produce the corn silage and then at just as soon as that silage is off the field go in and plant a cool season crop and uh, say triticale or triticale mixed with a few other species for added diversity and and maybe a vining species like a winter pea 
that could fill in the gaps between the triticale plant, produce some protein, and then harvest that in, say, uh, late May the following year, and which might be a little late for planting corn, but is right on time, plant a forage sorghum, uh, like a, a dwarf forage sorghum that's much cheaper to plant than the corn, also gives you a little diversity in your system, and that could be chopped in, say, late November, and then that could in turn be followed by a, another cover crop, just put there to hold the soil, you know, do what a cover crop does, maybe some rye or hairy vetch, just to uh, give a little bit back to that soil uh, because silage is a very soil depleting crop, especially if the manure is never returned back to the field. But, uh, you know, and the other thing you could do is diversify that corn. Instead of corn by itself, you could plant something like uh, corn and cow peas or corn and sunflowers or mm -hmm. uh, something interseeded between the corn rows so that the day you harvest silage, you have something there photosynthesizing already, uh, returning some, some root exudates to the ground and, and maybe that can be pastured in the winter if pasturing is an option. I mean, there's there's a number of ways to diversify out of this system. What do you guys think? Yeah, uh, I was going to highlight that, particularly in, in interseeding corn. You know, in monoculture, you're, you hardly ever capture over 50% of the actual sunlight um, in a monoculture system just because of the angle of the leaves. But the more diversity you can add, uh, you're catching more sunlight, you're creating more carbon, you're stimulating more biology. Um, so I, I really think uh, that adding to that corn, whether a cow pea, a sunflower, something with high, you know, even a squash or a pumpkin in there. Um, <clears throat> part of that is also, you know, 90% of your minerals are available uh, through a plant in the dry form, if you're if you have a mineral program, uh, a lot of times that mineral that's coming in the bag is only 20% available to that plant. So getting it in the plant form through biology, through soil health, is going to be a lot better for animal performance. So part of it is yield here, um, but other parts may be animal performance. If you add BMRs in there, um, every degree of of palatability can increase animal performance or digestibility can increase animal performance three to five percent. So there, there's a lot of options there. Um, you know, part of it is yield, part of it's dry matter intake, but part of it could be mineral density, uh, animal, you know, plant diversity for the animal's health uh, benefit. There's a lot of aspects to take that. So yeah. I, I agree, though. I mean, corn is pretty hard to beat. You know, the initial question, um, how can we add to it is what what, you know, we really do look at in that scenario. Yeah, no, that's right. Corn, corn is going to be hard to beat. You need to kind of be like my wife, you know, when she gets something, it's, oh, this is really nice. So what, what else do I get too? And so, so, so the answer is not, what can I have instead of corn? This is being but... recorded, Keith. <laughs> I know she's not going to watch it. <laughs> on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be flattered if she actually sees this. But the question is, what else can you add with the corn to to extend the benefits? And uh, I think you guys gave great answers on that. So uh, definitely, you know, I wouldn't necessarily try to replace the corn, but what can you add to it? Not only to build diversity, <clears throat> but also to build that overall tonnage. And I think even by going to a shorter season corn, if you needed to, you know, if you took that triticale silage off in late May, you could go to a shorter season corn or like Dale said, or even a, a forage sorghum for silage and your overall tonnage for the year is still going to be higher, especially, especially in that good country there in, in Iowa. So uh, great answers there. Hope that helped, Eric. Uh, what other questions uh, do we have from out there, either on Facebook or uh, from our uh, people that are logged on here? 
Sure, surely somebody's got a question. You didn't just come on to hear answers, did you? We, we I, I would like to add, I, I would love for somebody to try gourds mm -hmm. in, in, in the silage corn because it, it vines like a pumpkin, but it climbs and the fruits hang up in the canopy. I think that'd be a, a great way of adding a lot of energy density to some a silage crop. Yeah, Nebraska has done a lot of research on pumpkins, particularly for energy content. And a lot of a lot of your vining species are really, really high in energy, you know, 80, 80 percent digestibility in energy. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that, uh, you know, you can go out there and, you know, it, assuming my wife does hear this and I'm being the doghouse, see, I could go out and pick a whole mess of gourds for her to decorate the house with and get out of the doghouse before we take silage off that. So uh, we do have a question in the Q&A box. It's uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, they, and this is a great question, great question. How do you deal with Palmer amaranth? Uh, how do you do it with fewer herbicides? Plus, if you do have to use herbicides, how will this set back restoring soil health? So Dale, why don't you start with that? Cause I know you've got an entire presentation. We, we don't want you to give the entire presentation <laughs> about Palmer amaranth control. Uh, I will find the link to that and I'll put it in the chat box so people can watch that on YouTube. Uh, but go ahead and uh, kind of give us the, the Cliff's Notes version of how to deal with this. Okay. Um, if, you, if you've ever watched a movie about an assassin, the first thing the assassin does is they study their target. And if you understand the needs and wants of Palmer amaranth and deprive that plant of those needs, then Palmer amaranth is going to have a real hard time. Uh, what conditions does Palmer amaranth like? Well, it likes, it, it's very small seeded plant. So that seed only contains a small amount of energy and it really, really has to have its nitrogen in the nitrate form. Uh, it, it has a hard time using even, even ammonium. It does not utilize well. It likes nitrate. And so it, it likes bare soil. Why does it like bare soil? Well, that seed contains only a, a small amount of energy. Uh, it's only about enough to grow a three quarters of an inch long sprout. So if it generates in soil that's covered in mulch, that's more than three quarters of an inch thick, those seedlings have a very difficult time reaching sunlight before they run out of the energy stored in the seed. So having a good thick mulch can control it and then depriving the plant of nitrate. And if your next crop is soybeans, using a, a cover crop like rye, really any winter cereal, um, but rye is particularly effective because it, it has an added layer of control as we'll discuss in a bit. But just sucking up all that nitrogen that's left over from the previous crop and it, you're not making the nitrogen disappear, you're just changing it from nitrate into protein in that residue. And if your next crop is soybeans, they're a legume, they make their own nitrogen. So they don't mind having a low nitrogen condition. In fact, they'll thrive and fix more free nitrogen in a low nitrate condition. And then the, uh, the other thing, well, the couple other uh, things that can really help in the fight against Palmer amaranth, allelopathy. There are some, some uh, cover crops that are allelopathic towards uh, pigweeds, Palmer amaranth, water hemp, so forth. Um, rye is probably the most famous of those. Um, has three compounds that are toxic to pigweeds. Uh, Harry Vetch has a compound that's toxic to pigweeds and in our plots last year, we noticed that uh, uh, peas, spring peas, winter peas, also seem to be very, very suppressive against pigweeds. Um, and some of the mustards, 
appear to be pretty suppressive against big leagues. Um, and then finally, another tool that you can use is, uh, is mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, pigweeds are not mycorrhizal hosts, so they don't benefit from the association, uh, which means if you give your crops mycorrhizal fungi that extend out and expand that the ability to absorb water and nutrients out of the soil, they can basically outcompete the pigweeds for any nitrates in the soil. And without that nitrate, remember, pig, pigweeds just don't thrive. And we, we've got a, a picture we can probably post uh, of one of our plots. And it's not uh, Palmer amaranth, but it is kochia, which is also non-mycorrhizal. And where we inoculated the plot, two adjacent plots, one inoculated, one not, the size of the kosher shrank from waist high to about six inches tall, just to the line where we inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi. Really gives a tremendous advantage to your crop. I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little nervous, uh, Dale, that you know how to think like an assassin quite, quite so well. So uh, I'm going to get nervous. By the way, I can I have a raise? So. <laughs> I see you studying me so intently there. I've got to, get a little nervous. but, but, you know, to your point on, on the mycorrhizal uh, fungus and, and, and I think it, it goes beyond that even, you know, as people are doing these biological soil tests and they're seeing their fungal to bacteria ratio, you know, get better and, and have more just overall fungal component and less bacteria they're seeing less and less pigweeds and uh, well, just weeds in general, but certainly pigweeds specifically because they thrive in a bacterially dominated soil and they, they do not want to grow in a fungal soil. And uh, things that will promote bacterial dominated soil are tillage and monocultures and high doses of synthetic inputs, which you know, uh, many of us, you know, we're still guilty of that on some of our stuff too. And so sometimes we create our own problems and then we got, we got to kind of back our way out uh, and figuring out how to deal with that. Brett, do you have anything to add to that? But we got a couple questions on Facebook I'll go to next. Oh, not a whole lot. I mean, Dale really hit the nail on the head there. Um, I'll just say a little bit of what I've done down here is I've really, I've done some trials of cutting cold turkey on on fertilizers down here, um, you know, in a grazing system. And I have not seen a pigweed on my place yet. And I know they're there. It's just, since I've cut out the artificial inputs, I, I haven't seen it. Now I do have mare's tail and other, other types of weeds that are, are of a concern or finding other ways to control. But as far as the pigweed, the, the boogeyman in the closet um, has not shown its face in, in terms of my system doing it that way. So, yeah. Um, you know, yeah. To, to add on to Dale's point about, you know, just that residue, you know, to the, that thick mulch mat to prevent that seed from germinating and coming on. Most of the time, what we see when we grow cover crop rye is we can really have effective, you know, we can almost completely eliminate mare's tail because that comes on so early. And I can really, really, uh, put the hurt on the early flushes of pigweed and water hemp and amaranth. But it seems like as I get into the summer and my canopy, you know, that, that residue mulch breaks down that, you know, that what makes Palmer such a tough enemy is it just, it just will germinate all through the year. Uh, our organic guys in Indiana who have been doing this for a long time, here's the number that they tell us. And this is a big number. They say to have season long control of weeds from a cover crop, they, they want to see 8,000 pounds of dry matter. Okay, now that's not 8,000 tons of a wet clipping, that's 8,000 pounds of dry matter out there is what they think they need to get in order to have season long weed control from that mulch. And so, you know, that, that's going to be a pretty good rye crop that's, you know, six feet tall and, and heads out before you roll it down. Uh, you can't be spraying your rye out when it's 18 inches tall and expect to have 
uh, in much weed control, you know, once you get into June, July, and August. So just keep those things in mind. The, you know, that may not be as important to you as moisture conservation if you're in a drier area. Uh, you may not want to delay your planting in order for your cover crop to get to that stage. So there's a lot of considerations to be made there, but that's just, that's a number that I hear thrown out there on how much biomass you need for that really good uh, control. Uh, Michael Thompson has a great question on Facebook. Uh, he is asking if open pollinated corn in a warm season mix is a good viable alternative to BMR grazing corn in that same grazing mix. And uh, Michael, my answer to that is we're, we're sure gonna find out and you're gonna help us find out. Uh, we've been selling a, a couple of different types of, of BMR corn and they've worked pretty well. Uh, but we are going to be looking at some open pollinated corns this year. Uh, we're gonna be trying to grow some Jimmy Red corn. And you know, based on some of the things that, that Michael and, and uh, other people have been seeing out in their fields, uh, you know, we do think that some of these older heritage type open pollinated corns can be a very viable option uh, because they, you know, don't have uh, as high as lignin as, as some of the new modern varieties, certainly that like what a GMO, like a BT corn or something like that would have. We just think that palatability is going to be higher. Uh, you know, when you go out and you do a bricks measurement in, in the summertime, uh, those open pollinated, especially the older heritage types like a Jimmy Red, are going to be higher, you know, in that bricks level. And I don't know, Brett, have you, have you done much, you know, with open pollinated corn? I haven't done a whole lot, but a little bit to kind of address, you know, the particularly that high bricks is what's really intriguing um to me because part of your digestibility you need mineral density uh, for that process you know the bmr trait in the corn or sorghums is reducing that lignin but we're not necessarily increasing the the mineral density now if we have a plant out there with a higher bricks content or can host with soil health better or or you know, whatever, to raise that bricks content um, naturally, um, I think it has a lot of merit um, in, in a system like that. So um, both of them are going to have both good traits. You know, the, the BMRs are still, still very beneficial in a feed system, but, you know, the bricks indicator, <clears throat> the other side of that is if that plant is producing higher sugars and minerals, according to John Kempf, if that plant is putting off more sugars, we're hopefully leaching more sugars to the soil biology too, you know? So, you know, that that's an opinion or assumption of mine is, you know, we are essentially putting off more sugars to the biology with a crop that, that, that uh, tests higher in bricks. So there's a lot of factors that do affect bricks. I just want to say that um, maturity, uh, climate, uh, stresses, et cetera, do affect bricks. Soil health affects bricks. Um, but, you know, on a scale, uh, if that plant particularly is, is always testing higher in different climates, then I think that's a good, good opportunity or good, good plant to be using. Yeah, and Steve asked a follow-up question on Facebook. How, do, how does popcorn compare, you know, kind of in that mix, you know, BMR corn, open pollinated corn, popcorn. Uh, we have been using popcorn uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it, it, uh, it is going to be lower in lignin, uh, and it is a guaranteed non-GMO because it does not cross-pollinate with dent corns. And so, you know, we have a really high confidence in its GM, non-GMO purity. Uh, Dale, have you seen, you know, we've, we've sold a decent amount of popcorn. We grew some popcorn last year that was a monstrous plant. I mean, we got a variety of popcorn. We went to the popcorn breeders and said, we want the biggest, tallest, leafiest popcorn plant that you've got, because we don't care about the grain yield. We just want, you know, a lot of biomass to graze. And, and the breeder said, oh, I've got just the thing for you. And we grew that. And if any of you were at our, our, our summer field days last year, you saw it. And that stuff, I mean, it looked like field corn. It was, it was a huge plant. 
Uh, Dale, what have you seen in the guys that you've sent popcorn out to for grazing? Uh, they, they like it. Uh, it's definitely better than, you know, dent corn, um, especially modern dent corn, you know, uh, BT and, and so forth. Um, the palatability is well in excess of normal field corn. Um, probably, I would say it's probably comparable to the open pollinated bent corns. And uh, it's going to be a notch below the BMR corn. But, um, you know, one, one place I really like to use popcorn, is, you know, for an August planting. And because of the round seed size and how easily it goes through a drill compared My to bent corn. You did hear me. <laughs> Sorry. And, and uh, it does stand a lot better in the fall and winter than what BMR corn does. BMR corn, because of the lack of lignin, really kind of melts away and lays flat on the ground after frost, and popcorn will actually stick up a little bit. So that can be valuable. Eric had his hand up for quite a while here. Yeah. I just one thing before we move on to that, we are going to be doing some trials this coming year and we'll have the BMR corn, the open pollinated uh, Jimmy red corn and popcorn all side by side. We'll, we'll measure them for biomass, we'll measure them for nutrient content, and then we'll turn cattle in and graze it and we'll kind of do a palatability study. Uh, we want to do this in, in several locations. So if you think that you're set up to be able to do that, and, and collect some good data for us, or at least allow us to come in and collect some good data. Uh, shoot us an email and let us know because we are going to be doing some of those side-by-side -side comparisons just so we have a better answer to that question. But, yeah, yeah. I, would like, I, I would like to add a little bit to that on the popcorn. Just I did plant some this spring here down in Oklahoma and uh, I think the seed size is a huge benefit of popcorn. I'm actually uh, running it through soybean plates in my uh, John Deere 7000 planter and doing a mix of peas, popcorn. And uh, uh, so hopefully, you know, we'll know hopefully in a couple of weeks if I'm doing too much seed damage there. But as far as I can tell, I'm finding, you know, that the popcorn flows through soybean plates in a John Deere 7000 relatively easy. So it makes mixes a lot easier to do through a planner. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, Eric, uh, if you want to unmute yourself, you can ask your question now. You've got your hand up. Can, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, I was going to try to no-till plant into corn, into living rye, and then um, spread urea 80 pounds with an end serve and then I'll come back with Y drops. Is that gonna get enough nitrogen being it's on living rye or am I gonna run short before it gets to it? Well, you're definitely right to be concerned about that nitrogen tie up because when you plant green like that, the biggest, the, the biggest risk in my opinion is uh, nitrogen tie-up because that rye is going to have everything in your soil profile sucked up. <clears throat> it's very good at doing that and, that and that's great ahead of soybeans. That's exactly what you want. Ahead of corn, you really have to manage that well. Uh, so you're, you're wanting to spread the urea at planting time. Is that the timing on that? Yeah, right after I get it planted, I'd go back. Yeah, <clears throat> and you do 80 pounds of actual in then and then how much would you put on with your wide drops from an, probably about another 80 yeah you know the 160 pounds all you know after or at planting or after i would think that that's going to be pretty close to you know getting you a, a full you know nitrogen needs uh, you would want to make sure you got that rye killed, you know, terminated immediately after planting so that it doesn't linger out there and, you know, suck up half that 80 pounds that you put on, you know, right after you planted your corn. So are you rolling that rye down or how are you going to terminate that? 
most years it I'm I, I'm the one from Northeast Iowa, and and it usually hasn't been getting very big, so okay. it's been I don't know eight inches tall is about as big as it's been. Oh. When the corn uh, last year the corn was about two inches tall when I killed it, and the rye was eight inches tall. Okay. So if, if you're terminating your rye at that stage, I wouldn't have any concerns at all with nitrogen tie-up because your carbon nitrogen ratio on that is so low, that rye is going to disappear. Whatever nitrogen it has in its biomass is going to cycle back through the system, and, and I think you'll be fine. Where, where people have the issues is when they're planting a little later, they're planting into rye that's starting to head out, you know, it's five feet tall. Uh, that's where you really have those issues. So with the program that you're talking about, I think your nitrogen program is spot on. I don't, I don't think you'll have any issues with that at all. And in fact, if you, if you did get your corn planting delayed for some reason and that rye got even bigger, I think you'd still be okay from a nitrogen cycling standpoint uh, because you're delaying those applications and you know, you're going to cycle that through as long as that rye is, when it's pre-boot, again, that carbon nitrogen ratio is pretty low and it's going to cycle pretty quickly. Okay. Uh, I would, I would add something to that. Um, a lot of times there, there's a yield depression of corn following rye that really isn't, doesn't seem to be accounted for completely by nitrogen. And I'm, I'm looking for uh, a an article I was going to try to send it to Keith that uh, talks about uh, Iowa State did some study and they found that corn planted into green rye had very high levels 80 percent plus levels of uh, lithium and fusarium root rot uh, when planted green into rye. It's like the rye acted as a green bridge for those organisms. And corn planted into rye that had been killed uh, more than 14 days prior had 5 to 10% of those diseases. Hmm. And uh, there's quite a, quite a yield hit in those fields now. That's not to say that it's a guarantee if you plant green into rye that you'll have those issues because you know those organisms need specific conditions and they need certain amount of moisture and, and uh, you know no guarantee that that's going to happen. But um, I think most of the yield depression that we see in corn in planted into rye is due to nitrogen, but that uh, that green bridge to uh, that builds up those uh, pathogenic populations can also be an explanation. And their recommendation was to kill the rye two weeks prior to planting corn. So that's you know not maybe not the best for long-term soil health, but it it will help preserve the yield potential on your corn. That are uh, my, my neighbor. My my neighbor has uh, he's been doing the cover crops here, rye and strip till for I don't know 10, 15 years, and he does custom strip tilling, so he's always late getting his corn planted. So his oh, rye is big, and he he's had he's got an eighty acres that he split. The long way and he's been doing cover crops on the one half and just strip till on the other half and no cover crop and over the years he's been a couple bushel more in the rye and then this year it got late or he planted his corn no tilled at this time into the rye they had nitrogen on the planter and then it got wet he didn't get the rye killed right away and the rye was like three feet tall before they got it killed and he didn't knock it down or anything so the corn had to grow through it and we had a bit of a dry year this year and the corn that was in the rye cover crop was I think like 
Now this was comparing like 40 acres and 40 acres. It wasn't a perfect comparison, but it was like 27 bushels better this year. And it come through great big rye and everything else. But he did have the nitrogen right there by it when he planted. Uh-huh. Oh, that's quite a difference. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would like to highlight, you know, a little bit, you know, if he's been doing that for quite a few years too, you know, if it's if it's your first year or second year, you may not necessarily expect that. But you know, we we do see those cases of of success too when when times are really stressful but you know the the highlight is consistency and soil health as a program you know it's a long-term goal versus you know a one-year fix so yeah yeah i i saw a uh, university of nebraska did a study oh gosh i think it started in the 80s um where they grew corn into rye um, and kept the nitrogen, nitrogen was 200 pounds an acre, and the yield levels were about 160, so it was pretty well fertilized with nitrogen, um, and they did it for 10 years in a row. The first three years, uh, the rye, the corn in the rye was 30 bushel less than the control, and, you know, I guess this is why it's good that we have long-term research because any farmer probably would have quit the practice at that point. You know, I'm not going to spend extra money to take a 30 bushel yield hit. The next two years though, the yields were dead even. And the final five years of the study, they got a 30 bushel bump every year, just like clockwork. It was almost exactly 30 bushel every single year after that. So what's the explanation here? Well, the first year, maybe there was nitrogen tie up, maybe there was, uh, you know, an increase in root disease, maybe there was, you know, some sort of allelopathy, but whatever it was, the longer you stuck with it, that became less and less of an issue. And I think a lot of the people that are planting corn into rye green and say they have absolutely no issues have been no-tilling cover cropping for quite some time and have pretty healthy soils. Yeah. And if that's the case, those root diseases are going to be far less of an issue than they are if you're doing it the first year out. Yeah, th those are all great points, and you know the you you can't you can't just do it a year or two and give up like like Dale said. That's the advantage of long term research, and 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 there's enough people that have done it for many years. You know, uh, like your neighbor Eric, uh, that is seeing those benefits now, and you know from additional organic matter, additional biological activity, uh, those soils are just so much more resilient uh, that they can handle all of that. Let's, uh, let's use that to pivot to another question here on, on biology. Uh, we have a question, Dale, we'll start with you on this one because the question is, what's the best way to add AMF or arbuscular mycorrhiza fungi? What's the best way to add that to fields? Is it through manure, uh, through like a Johnson Sioux, you know, compost extract or something like that, seed coatings, other inputs, not tilling or something else? T tell us a little bit about the best way to get the AMF in the soil and, and, and maybe even a little bit about is there, is those organisms also already in the soil? Do I need to add it? Well, um, most of our cropland, I, you know, I did, uh, I studied uh, 46, uh, 56, excuse me, 56 paired samples that had been sent into a lab for analysis. People wanted to know whether or not they had mycorrhizal fungi. Of those 56 paired samples taken from all over the US, um, only four had adequate levels of mycorrhizal fungi. And all four of those were cropland that had been recently cleared from either prairie or forest. Um, typical cropland has very low levels of mycorrhizal fungi if any at all, um, because 
mycorrhizal fungi dies out during fallow periods. And almost all of our cropland has had fallow periods as part of the crop rotation. And an exception might be, you know, some of the old Amish farms like in Pennsylvania that followed a, a crop rotation where they had five years of alfalfa within the crop rotation and just a couple years of corn and then back to alfalfa. And um, that is a long enough perennial sequence to build the mycorrhizal spores up. Uh, but we usually don't get spore production in annual crops. Um, it, it takes several months for those spores to form. So most of our cropland is mycorrhizal deficient. The only way you get that back is by putting spores back out there. The spores don't blow in the wind. You don't create them with any sort of compost method. Um, it has to come from spores produced by mycorrhizal fungi on a living reef. And you, you can, I mean, the original way that people got mycorrhizal inoculants, produced them, was to go to relic natural areas, prairies, woodlands, um, even deserts, and got, so, got roots from perennial natural plants and uh, you know, ground the soil up and centrifuged out the spores and then inoculated plants in a, a culture, a culture medium, and then harvested the spores after a period of of several months. And uh, you can do that process yourself if you want to. I mean, there are uh, Dr. David Dowd's the USDA published uh, procedures for producing your own mycorrhizal inoculant. You can go through a few hundred hours of labor and 18 months later, you can have your own inoculant or you can spend 12 bucks in an acre and buy a commercial inoculant where someone's already done that work. And that, that's my preference. You know, you, you can, if you have, most soils have very small levels. Uh, it's very rare that you find zero on an analysis, but two, 3% colonization is quite common. And 30% uh, is considered an effective amount. If you no-till a cover crop without fallow periods for several years in a row, you can build that level up over time. Um, but, you know, why, why forego the benefits for four or five years when you could have them essentially instantly by inoculating? I mean, the same, we don't ever ask this question about rhizobium inoculant. You know, it's like if I grow, if I grow three bushel soybeans for 10 years in a row, will I eventually get soybean inoculant in my field? Maybe. Um, but why would you go through miserable poor soybean yields for years on end when you could just cheaply inoculate? What what I always tell people is don't don't spend your money on a mycorrhizal inoculant if you're not going to follow that up with the management practices and the rotation to keep that mycorrhizal investment. And you got to look at it as an investment to keep it alive and active. So that means you know no uh, no long fallow periods, uh, no harsh tillage passes. You know something growing all the time. Uh, it, it's a real good investment uh, if you're putting in perennials. Uh, it, it, but it's also a good investment if you know you're going to have something growing there uh, year after year and you don't have those long fallow periods. So it's uh, a great investment when you are at the beginning of committing to a cover crop program. Yeah. No Brett, fallow periods. Brett, here's, here's a good one for you. This is right in your wheelhouse. Ron from Mississippi is saying they recently rented some pasture land that's primarily Bermuda. Uh, what can they interplant into that existing Bermuda sod to improve these pastures in the summer? And then also they'd like to plant ryegrass with legumes for the winter. 
uh, what what do you recommend? And, and I know you've done a lot of work on this. In fact, our soil health resource guide that we just printed and published, and if you don't have a copy, you can request one. Uh, Brett's got a good article in there about this exact topic. So Brett, go ahead and take this one. Yeah, uh, so kind of answering that question going into summer, summer can be kind of tough um, on the Bermuda grass. It's you're, you're competing against a perennial. It depends on how much residue is there, how much fertility is there, et cetera. My favorite times to plant on Bermuda grass are spring or fall. Um, you're getting a, the, bit, the big advantage or disadvantage about Bermuda is, is that it has a big winter window bef uh, of dormancy. And so the advantage is that you have a lot of time to grow a lot more diversity uh, when it's dormant. So in the spring time frame, say if you're going in early here and your Bermuda is just starting to wake up being in Mississippi, um, I would look at spring peas yet. Um, focus really on the large seeds that have a lot of stored energy. They're going to get up and grow faster than your small seeds. Clovers, alfalfa, chicory, plantain they're kind of a lot like that pigweed question we talked about earlier is they don't have a lot of stored energy in that seed. And so it's going to take some time for them to establish. And, and a lot of times starting this late in your environment, um, those smaller seeds are not going to work until the, the fall time frame. So vetches, um, sunflowers, buckwheat, those have all worked really well. Uh, larger seeds here, you know, right as Bermuda is either breaking dormancy or a couple weeks before. I have seen some people plant some grasses. Now, I typically, I'm not in a fertilizer scenario. And so I really focus on the, the broadleaf taproot tap legumes to fix my nitrogen in that scenario. And not so much on the grasses because Bermuda's scavenges a lot of nitrogen, ties up a lot of nitrogen. And so typically the grasses, uh, I wouldn't say that you don't use any, but uh, keep them below 30% in the mix uh, if you're not planning on using nitrogen just because they're not going to outperform. Now I've seen some plots down around San Antonio that one of our partners did and uh, he heavily grazed an area with sheep and goats and grazed it down. And so it received a lot of fertility through manure and he planted in some sorghums right at the time uh, Bermuda was breaking dormant and had decent luck. It definitely added to his biomass. Um, but you know, if that soil isn't receiving a lot of extra fertility then I really focus on the, the broad leaf and tap roots. And, Probably the bigger question to ask for, before you really get started is what your pH is. Uh, that's probably one of the bigger limiting factors is that ground was farmed for a long time in cotton or peanuts. And we naturally put it to Bermuda grass because it was degraded and no longer performing. And so we're expecting Bermuda grass to perform in a soil that was already mined out. And that's why we need so much more for fertility in Bermuda. And so uh, understanding where your pH is at is probably your first step in, in getting legumes in there. Fall time frame ryegrass works good. Uh, but again, the legumes getting some nitrogen in there, you have a lot of carbon built up uh, from the Bermuda grass, getting some organic nitrogen for your biology to help cycle that carbon. Um, is, is what's really going to help you increase your water infiltration, your biology, your organic matter, um, along with building, you know, fixing nitrogen for the following year. So vetches in the fall work good. Uh, I would highly look at alfalfa, chicory, and plantain in the fall as an opportunity, but you're going to want to graze that down uh, to about four, four inches or so. Uh, to get those smaller seeds in there. So you'll do a pulse grazing there in the fall before you plant. So, but like I said, there's a lot more details in that article and uh, that help explain that process and, and looking at that of what I've learned over the couple of years. Yeah, great. Yeah, I, 
And Dale, why don't, why don't you speak a little more specifically about kind of the concept, same concept, because somebody else on, on the Q&A also had a question about interceding into perennials. Why don't you talk about it from the perspective of what would be more common up in our area where you have a cool season grass, you know, like brome or fescue or something. What can you do to get warm season things growing there through the summer? Okay. Yeah. And, and I might just add on top of Brett, he, he mentioned about sampling for pH in a pasture situation where all of the nitrogen is broadcast on the surface and has not been historically incorporated. A lot of that acidity builds up from that nitrogen fertilizer right in the surface inch. And so a six inch sample might show up, it's fine in pH, but that surface inch, I've, I've seen where um, a six inch sample tested six two in pH and the top inch tested at four and, and nothing grows at pH four. You, you won't get legume seedlings to thrive at that. And uh, luckily it only takes, you know, one six, if you're only trying to neutralize the top inch instead of six inches, it only takes one sixth of the lab recommended amount of lime to, to neutralize that. But it can be pretty important for getting something established there. As far as getting something seeded into a, a cool season grass sod, it's, it's usually a bit more difficult than a cool season into a warm season like Bermuda grass because the, the cool season grass in summer does not go completely dormant like a warm season does in winter. winter. So you, you've got that competition from the cool season grass. Um, how do you minimize that? How do you uh, still do this interseeding thing? And it's a great idea because cool season grasses just do not make effective use of that summer sun because it's just too hot. So getting a, a summer annual grass or summer annual legumes or forbs out there is a really good idea. Um, but the timing is, is important. Um, you don't want to go too early uh, because the cool season grass is still too competitive. So like here in Kansas, Nebraska, um, May, maybe May might have the proper temperatures to get those warm season plants going, but it's still cool enough that the cool season grasses are still active and still competitive. Um, but by mid-June, however, it's starting to get warm enough that those cool season grasses are starting to brown out. And usually we're still getting some rain in the end of June. You know, it seems like the rain usually shuts off and it gets too hot and dry to really grow much of anything after the 4th of July. So I really like, if you're going to drill warm season into a cool season sod, I like the last two weeks of June, unless you're going to use a herbicide or something like that to suppress the sod. Um, if you're not going to use a herbicide to suppress it, um, I would target, I would graze it down fairly close, you know, like Brett said, four inches or maybe even a little more and, and drill into it those last two weeks of June. And the, the plants we've seen that work well drilled into that sod, number one, far and away, is Egyptian wheat, which is open pollinated sorghum. That stuff just flat works. I, I, I don't know that I've ever seen Egyptian wheat fail in a sod seeding. Um, why it is so much better than the hybrids, I can't tell you. It just seems to be. Um, had good luck with uh, sorghums in general. Uh, pearl millet does okay. Um, hey, hey, Dale. Yeah. I've, I'm sharing my screen and I'm showing that picture that we had in a resource guide a few years ago with you standing mm -hmm. out there in that field in Kansas. So you can kind of be describing that as well. Yeah. Well, you can see that uh, very prominent plant there in that mix. Uh, you can see some pearl millet seed heads poking up there. Um, 
but uh, the sun hemp was really dominant and, and sun hemp works exceptionally well. Um, I have heard that sesbania does well. We're starting to carry a little sesbania. A um, little unsure of the grazing value of sesbania, uh, but uh, it does seem to thrive. Um, we uh, cow peas function well. Sunflowers are kind of iffy. Uh, forward soybeans seem to do well. Uh, sunflowers are so cheap, though, that you can you can throw several pounds out there and not run into a lot of money. And then uh, um, we've got some people trying some popcorn. Uh, I haven't had good luck with dent corn, but if you can get some leftover seed corn that you know can't be sold, broken bag, leftover plot seed, whatever, I I, I tell people. Going out into a cool season grass pasture with it's a good way of using it. Yeah, and and Dale, if he's soiled in mice. Is it accurate to say that this picture you're standing here, this is the same field, just where yes. you did not put the inner seed? So where you're standing here is the same as where you're standing there, just without the inner seed. S same same field, um, basically. Uh, inner seed was on the east half of that field. And the other photo was on the west half of that field. And that there, been, you've there, done both halves. <laughs> there had been 16 inches of rain in July and August on those fields. So that, that was a very wet summer, which obviously contributes to the success of that interseeding. But you can see how little use the brome alone made of that 16 inches of rainfall. All right, good. So there's a lot of potential. It's not going to work like that every year, but man, no. if you get that kind of production. That doesn't have to work every year. For, yeah, for that to it's really neat. Work. Yeah, what, what's interesting though is is that every year you do it, you know, conditions. Assuming the conditions are the same each year, it seems like it gets more successful each year. You know, when, when I first tried it, I had what most people would call a failure the first year is very dry. Um, and, but I was encouraged enough by what I saw, it was a lot more feed than I had without doing it. The second year I did more acres and where I did it the second year was so much better than where I did it for the first time. And side by side feet, it was actually the same field, just more acres within that same field. And so every year you do it, it seems to get more and more successful. Yeah. Yeah. Let's I kind of I kind of refer to that system as, you know, a lot of a lot of our perennial systems we, by chemical applications of, of herbicides, uh, we've taken out a lot of the legumes and broadleafs. I kind of refer to it as like feeding a cow. You you can kill a cow with too much fiber. And we're starving our earthworms and our biology by having a lot of carbon and no organic nitrogen there or mineral uh, cycling for those biology to digest that carbon. And I so agree. that's what I saw in, in the Bermuda grass. Once I got these legumes going, the, the, the organic matter and the, the, the color of the so soil profile drastically changed in, in a real relatively short amount of time, because I had the carbon there, there was just nothing, no organic nitrogen there for the biology to digest it and, and well, you, utilize it. Changed in, in a real relatively short amount of time, because I had the carbon there, no organic nitrogen there for the biology to digest it and, and well, you, utilize it. <clears throat> Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, let's do one more question here from Facebook. Uh, Derek is asking about, there's a lot of research going into interseeding corn. Are there tips on interseeding anything, a grazing mix into standing soybeans without interfering with harvest? And uh, we have gotten that question a decent amount. 
I have always said the answer to that is not really because you know you're you're harvesting those beans so low to the ground that whatever you have out there is going to have to go through the combine, and, and that is still true. Um, I do have uh, some some pretty innovative guys up in Minnesota. We're sending a mix up there to them. They've experimented with this, and they're kind of moving forward. Uh, they're planting their beans in 30 inch rows. And so they've got a little bit more time for the, for the cover crop to grow in between the rows and they've got a mix. They've got several different things in there, uh, buckwheat and flax and, and different things, but you, you definitely are more restricted because you are harvesting those soybeans very low and whatever is out there is going to have to go through the combine. Now, with that being said, I don't know how much grazing benefit that you'll get because again, you're running that through the combine. If you're planting it with the beans, uh, you know, up front, if you fly that on when the bean leaves are starting to yellow, you know, you can get rye grass or cereal rye or different things like that going that can, can have some grazing benefits after harvest. Um, I have had guys that have planted buckwheat either on purpose or they just had volunteer buckwheat come with their soybeans and uh, you know, they either spray it out with a post spray application that they were going to do anyway, or they just let it mature and that buckwheat pretty well goes, you know, makes seed and goes to seed and isn't a harvest issue because of that. Uh, that tends to work pretty well too. You may end up with some buckwheat in your soybean, uh, you know, in, in the combine tank because you're probably going to harvest some buckwheat with that. But, you know, that that's a tough one because, you know, soybeans just you know, the way that we harvest them doesn't allow for a lot of other stuff underneath it without having to go through the combine. Dale or Brad, have you guys seen anything with, with that, that uh, would make you think something's worth trying? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of where that pasture cropping idea really probably has more merit of growing soybeans over the top of a cool season grass, a perennial, and you know we're looking at the summer dormant chisholm fescue here as a as a potential opportunity in the south because it physically goes summer dormant and so we can grow a cowpea or a soybean over the top of that to where it starts coming out in september and we can harvest uh harvest that in in october um as far as your rye your rye grass your your annuals a lot of that benefit is not going to occur until the following spring on the grazing side. So you'll, you'll have, you might have some really high protein grazing there in the fall, but, but you're not going to have a lot of energy. And so you're not going to have the high, higher stocking rate that you would want to as say corn stalks or something like that. So. Yeah, I, I, I would caution people to stay away from trying to aerial seed turnips or radishes, mm -hmm. soybeans at leaf yellowing, uh, just because if, if harvest gets delayed with a long wet fall, you could get some development above ground of those roots that are gonna make harvest very difficult. Yeah, typically uh, cereal rye or annual rye grass, if that gets up into your header, you're just clipping those real fine, you know, uh, grass leaves off. And that's not that hard for your combine to process. But yeah, if you start getting a bunch of turnip leaves up in there, you probably aren't going to be very happy. So, uh, you know, there's some things that can be done, but it's it's definitely more difficult uh, in, in soybeans. We'll, we'll take one more question here. Uh, Marvin is asking, he bought an old no-till corn planter, 30-inch uh, row John Deere 1240, and he wants to, he's using it to plant sweet corn. Can he plant sunflowers, pumpkins, and other legumes with this? It's a plateless planter. Uh, you know, what, what options are out there for using a planter like that to plant some of these diverse mixes? Well, I'm not, I'm not super familiar with the plateless planter, um, but I know there's a lot of YouTube videos. I I, that's the reason why I bought a John Deere 7000 of, you know, so I can plant sunflowers and pumpkins and things like that. Um, I, I think if it's a finger pickup uh, system, you're going to be somewhat limited on density and seed size on doing mixes. And so uh, if it's the kind of the cup drop or, or 
you know, I, I've used some plates like cotton plates and things like that of playing around with seven, eight way mixes of similar seed size. And that seems to be working, but it, it kind of depends. Um, a lot of it's going to match up on seed size and that's what you're primarily paying attention to on, on something like that. But I think there's some opportunity. The benefit of, of pumpkins and vining crops is they'll cover 90 to 120 inches relatively easy. So you don't necessarily need to put them in with your corn or your sweet corn. You could do your sweet corn on 60s and put pumpkins in between on the other 60s or, or whatnot. So there's some opportunities there, yeah. My uh, level of expertise with machinery is almost as good as it is on computers. So <laughs> you shouldn't even touch that one. But. Yeah. You know, I, I'm like Brad, you know, we have dealt mostly with plate type planters. And I know you can buy special plates that allow you to plant some of those different mixes and stuff. Uh, all I can say is, you know, experiment with it. It sounds like you're probably doing it on a relatively small area. So I would experiment it on an area and, and see what happens. If, uh, if you can get some of that stuff to go through that, you know, great. If not, you may have to look for, you know, a small drill or another type of option to get that done. But I know with the plate planters, you can buy plates that will allow you to do cover crops now. And, and you know, they're getting better and better all the time. So um, folks, yeah. thank you for joining us. Lots of good information. If you have not signed up yet for what is starting next week, please make sure you get signed up. We've got Dr. Christine Jones from Australia. Many of you have heard her. Uh, she is probably one of the top soil microbiologists in the world. Uh, we're going to have her for four weeks in a row. So a, a four week uh, Dr. Jones marathon, if you will. And it's not just going to be for an hour. We're going to let her talk for at least an hour. And then we're going to do at least 30 minutes of Q&A uh, after that. So uh, you might want to get a snack and bring it with you because it's going to be good. Uh, three of the talks will be live. She'll be doing the secrets of the uh, socio microbiome. Uh, she'll be doing one on nitrogen. And uh, then the phosphorus talk, which will be the, the Tuesday after Easter, she did that one last fall. So we're just gonna play that recording. We're still working with her to see if we can do a, a live Q and A on that one or not. Uh, with, I, we don't know exactly what her travel plans will be with Easter in there. So uh, we'll, we'll, that'll kind of be a little bit of a rerun. Uh, and then the fourth one will be a focus on uh, cover crops for vineyards and orchards and kind of specialty type crop, things like that. So. If you haven't signed up, make sure you get signed up for that. If you don't have the sign up link, shoot me an email. It's just Keith at greencoverseed.com. We'll get you the link for that. Uh, we are hoping to have a really good turnout for that one and uh, you know, really have Dr. Jones give us a lot of good information and teaching. So thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, enjoy your evening and we will see you next week uh, on the Dr. Jones webinar. That'll start next week at 530 and we'll go for the next four Tuesdays after that. So thanks everybody.